Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Before we get to today's episode, I'd like to remind our listeners that if you enjoy Free Thoughts and you think other people might enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Now to today's episode. Joining us today is Ryan Bourne, the R. Evan Scharf Chair of the Public Understanding of Economics at Cato, and Diego Zuluaga, Associate Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Good to be with you. Thank you. Now, we're, we're all remote and uh, under the quarantine lockdown. I think Diego is in the UK right now, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and so we're all, everyone's going through this, and that's what we're going to discuss today, the sort of economics and policy elements of this lockdown. So we're almost surely going to enter a depression, although I'll, one of you probably can remind me that the actual definition of a depression versus a recession, but a worldwide one in the wake of this shutdown. Uh, how does this compare to previous recessions? Well, um, it depends on what time scale you're talking about. What's clear is this, this is an absolutely huge, unprecedented economic shock, the likes of which we haven't lived through uh, perhaps since um, the, the Great Depression, when you look at the fall in activity. So at the moment, there's been a fall in uh, day-to-day activity um, somewhere above 30%. Uh, so 30% of, of uh, goods and services are not being produced, or another way of looking at it, 30% of goods or, and services that would usually be uh, consumed are not being consumed. Now, in terms of that, the impact of that on GDP, because GDP is an annual measure, it really depends on what the duration of, of this uh, first stage of the pandemic, uh, how long that that lasts. Um, if that were to last just for three quarters, um, uh, sorry, one quarter, so three months, for example, you'd be looking at a downturn across this year of about eight and a half percent. Now, that's bigger than the financial crisis, but a lot of economists would imagine that um, because this is, to a certain extent, a temporary phenomenon, some of that activity would bounce back in the next year. So the central expectation, I think, of many economists is that when you look at this over a couple of year period, we're probably likely to lose about 4% of uh, annual GDP, annual output. So a recession... uh, equivalent to about two thirds of the size of the financial crisis. Now, of course, the big unknown factor here is that uh, even after this lockdown is lifted, it's not clear how much immediate rebound there's going to be, because it's highly likely that people are going to want to continue social distancing all the time. There's not a, a vaccine for this virus to avoid becoming infected. So I've always been much more pessimistic than many of the Keynesian leaning economists who type, kind of think, All governments have to do is protect the supply capacity of the economy today and then ensure demand is sufficient after lockdowns are lifted. Because I think even after lockdowns are lifted, there's going to be a long tail of this. Um, And uh, and as a result of changes in supply and demand that are going to occur as a result of that pandemic, actually, there'll be a bit of a trade-off from providing relief to try and keep the economy preserved as it is as it was in in March 2020 and the new economy we're moved towards so i expect this to be a drag on activity for the next 2 to 3 years so this is a little bit interesting though compared to say the great depression which we won't have to get into all the different causes of that but we have this sort of exogenous shock that hits everything as opposed to this idea that I think a lot of libertarians uh, like economists in general, that recessions and maybe even depressions are about reallocating resources to where they should be allocated. And so maybe they're occasionally good. But uh, I mean, is this different because maybe these resources were not misallocated? I mean, the economy was booming and then it just gets absolutely crushed by this surprising exogenous shock. I think that's right. The noticeable thing or the distinctive thing about what's going on right now is not so much that the recession was induced because we have lots of historical examples of recessions that have been induced by misguided government policy or by changes in the price of certain inputs that make it challenging for industries to continue to operate in the way that they did previously. But this one has been deliberately induced with a view to eliminating economic activity so that countries can contain the spread of the virus. And so the focus has been since then on keeping the structure of the economy as closely to what preceded it 
as possible in the expectation that that way things can restart as smoothly as possible in the aftermath. But as Ryan was noting, the longer we go, the more likely consumer preferences are likely to change, the more likely it is that businesses, even if they get payroll and utility and rent support in the way that a lot of countries have enacted, that they will still be unable to carry on their normal business in the future. I've seen some uh, expectations by investment banks that around 80% of retail businesses may close as a result of this. Of course, there's a lot of churn in the retail sector anyway, but that's still an enormous closure rate that they might expect in the future. And so even if we try to hibernate for however long this lasts, two months, three months, depends on the country, uh, you will still have to have a reallocation of resources and there will, be, there will be a loss of intangible capital and supplier relationships and human capital associated with it. Uh, yes, I agree with Diego on that. And, and there's two other points worth making on this. Um, a business cycle is something that's expected by most businesses and you kind of have to plan to a certain extent for downturns and have contingencies and, and think about that. Um, foreseeing a pandemic, a global pandemic, is a lot more difficult. Now, one could imagine major airlines, for example, uh, might have had to plan for substantial disruption to to air travel. There's sometimes events that that lead to that type of thing occurring. The the eruption of the volcano in Iceland, um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but certainly is an example of that. But it seems a bit of a stretch to presume that your local Indian restaurant could have foreseen a, a global pandemic and have taken out some form of insurance to protect against the loss of business that they're seeing. And the second point that I'd make here is that in a in a generalized recession, yes, some industries do tend to be more affected than others, but quite quickly that contagion spreads. Um, the direct consequences of this have been much stronger for certain industries. And Diego mentioned retail. But, you know, you can also think of hospitality, uh, entertainment industries, basically any industry where there's lots of social contact between uh, uh, customers and employees of businesses or crowds. So this is very, very different to the type of ordinary recessions that we might see. The the shift afterwards. Um, so let's let's bracket for a second the, the worries about what we'll call cultural changes of people maybe being hesitant even as restrictions are lifted to actually go back and do the kind of economic things that they used to do. But setting that aside because it seems like it, at some point in the future we will get over those, a lot of these industries that are really hurt are ones that seem like they will come back, right? Like there will be interest in restaurants again. It's not like we're going to culturally shift to not being interested in restaurants. And there will be um, interest in staying in hotels again. And I'm curious what you think of one of the one of the speculations that I've seen about the long term effects of this is is consolidation in those industries, because all of the mom and pops, the small businesses are the ones that Really, they don't have the cash reserves or the infrastructure to ride this sort of stuff out, so they'll close. And the bigger players, the chains, the you know, the massive hotel conglomerates, are the ones that will still be around, and they can you know buy up all of the the empty real estate and leftover materials for pennies on the dollar. And so the long term result is not fewer restaurants, but more chain restaurants. I think that's uh, a perfectly plausible possibility of what will happen. The, in an ideal world, you want to have businesses closed that don't satisfy what people want so that whatever resources they're using can be redeployed to areas that are more productive. The danger that often has been the case with government policy during recessions, for example, the Great Depression is, is a salient case where the Federal Reserve keeping money very tight uh, for years meant that a lot of perfectly viable businesses closed. The danger is that when you have that kind of situation, the costs of reallocating resources exceed the benefits from having new people, new businesses take up the old resources. And that's a net loss to society that ideally we want to avoid. In terms of consolidation, I think a lot of industries are likely to see it, if nothing else, because now this pandemic has shown that there is a risk in a lot of business operation that perhaps hadn't been taken into account uh, by companies. But I don't know that necessarily this will be 
uh, less the case, the bigger you are. Some of the biggest businesses in the world have been affected by this, and particularly because they're large and they try to optimize their capital structure, how much they borrow, uh, how much equity they hold, how much, how much cash they keep in the bank. They're often operating on very tight margins, and this disruption has really tilted them over the edge. And a lot of the government interventions since have been to try and provide liquidity to bridge the gap so that these businesses can continue business afterwards. We can have a discussion as to whether that's on net desirable or not. But you might have small businesses where people hold more time cash for longer or you know the programs work more effectively or people can redeploy themselves more easily. And so you might have churn at all levels of, of company sizes. Yes, I'd, I'd agree with Diego on that. Um, just two points. First of all, I don't accept the premise of the question, I don't think, Aaron, because in certain activities, such as going to movie theaters, for example, for years, there have been the buildup of alternatives to that many more people watching movies that are now released directly to streaming services like Netflix. One could imagine this, that, that this accelerates that trend. And actually, we might not uh, see a return of uh, as many movie sectors even after this has passed. Um, but it's also worth remembering, it depends on the sector you're looking at on the terms of impact on con uh, consolidation. One of the businesses that has been most affected, it's been like a dagger to the heart of its business, this pandemic, um, is uh, Disney. Now, if you look at Disney, uh, the main activities of that company are the running of theme parks, the delivery of new movies to, to theaters in particular, um, uh, sponsorship and uh, oversight of, of certain sports and delivery of cruises. Now, every single part of that business is going to be completely rocked. Disney has, to a certain extent, diversified by um, releasing last year its streaming service. But if it hadn't done that, its revenues would be plunging to near zero right now. Could have um, made some money off its back catalog of movies, but it's very small in terms of the you know, proportion of revenue that would be obtaining day to day. So I don't think it's necessarily true, and um, we can make the general observation that this will necessarily be worse for small businesses and lead to more consolidation because certain large businesses in, in those sectors that we mentioned earlier are completely being rocked by this. It's interesting because in the big picture, I like uh, this conversation because it's, it's part of the way we believe in the market, that the market is a discovery mechanism. So uh, I think I'd like to, Diego, you mentioned this idea of extending liquidity uh, and this question of maybe restaurants will fundamentally change going forward because people's preferences will change. And so the question of an efficient restaurant will be one that can operate with half the capacity that it used to have. And that might be true for 10 years of the foreseeable future. And we don't want to block these processes by which the investment in new types of capital, use of capital for the purposes of people, you know, demand, satisfying demand, uh, is, you know, that investment doesn't need to be blocked. So we'll talk about that liquidity uh, question. Is it, a, is it a difficult one for libertarians in the question of saying, you know, do we need to give these businesses a, you know, little bit of a life raft and then turn the economy back on? Or, or should we kind of avoid that? Sure. So first of all, the, the moral case, so to speak, for liquidity support is that in most cases, while the lockdowns, um, sorry, while the decline in economic activity was already starting before the government mandated lockdowns, the real sharp decline in economic activity began when governments mandated that people stay at home and mandated the closure of all non-essential businesses. And so when you have the government mandating that, making people unable to carry on business as usual, I, the, there's an expectation, at least by some people, that the government should then provide ways by which these people can fight, can sustain themselves for the period of time that the emergency lasts. It's as if the government had instituted a program that was of benefit to all, and it had to pay for people's cost of living for a period of time. Now, it's a very uncomfortable position for libertarians because we don't like necessarily government to be in such a position as to mandating the conduct of people's lives. But this is these are exceptional circumstances, and they demand exceptional measures in one form or another. On the economics of it, the textbook would say that if you have a viable business that is temporarily under strain because of some sort of exogenous factor or 
um, or a war or something along those lines, that there would be a case for giving it, extending it liquidity because it can continue doing business. And so to speak, this is a temporary situation. Maybe people's expectations are misplaced and losing it would be more damaging than the than the benefits from the resources spent, whatever they may be, in providing that liquidity plus uh, the reallocation in the future. And for a lot of businesses, I think, for some period of time, that is true. But of course, as time passes, businesses go from um, being viable and the relationships that they have from being valuable to deteriorating over time. And so regardless of what their initial viability may have been, uh, the case may change. And that's a question that is difficult to gauge at this stage, uh, but it also clearly will become more relevant as time passes with, with these lockdowns. This raises a question about the debate on how the government should be providing financial support during these times. So on the one hand, you could have the government providing these loans to small businesses to basically keep them keep them economically viable until this gets until this rides out and and as part of that they can then continue to pay the salaries of their employees even if those employees are you know their their productivity has basically dropped to zero the other option is to support the people directly through something like either the stimulus checks we got or a guaranteed minimum income or more robust unemployment benefits than if you lose your job. But it seems like both of those then, as I'm understanding what you're saying, have significant risks. So on the on the providing money support to businesses, you get into the situation of how long are these businesses viable? Are you propping up businesses that shouldn't have been around? Are you preventing the restructuring of the economy that we need for long-term growth? But on the other end of things, it seems like you're encouraging people to not be productive in the sense that you're encouraging them to stay home or at least incentivizing them to work less, which then means that whatever economic activity there would have been isn't really happening because there's not going to be any businesses that can find employees to do it. So how do we, is one is one better and how do we deal with those trade-offs? And I guess, is there a, is there a third alternative that would get around some of those problems? Right. I, I think that's a that it's it's a significant question, a very hard one to to answer at this stage. I think the the implementation is really what tilts the balance in favor of one or, or the other. What we're seeing in the U.S. is that a lot of the programs that are being implemented are first of all setting a precedent for Federal Reserve involvement in basically all credit markets in America, uh, but also government backstopping of all economic activity that is dangerous to the extent that it can continue into the foreseeable future because of the design of these programs as well. They were hastily designed. The goal is to get funds to people as quickly as possible rather than do proper screening and underwriting of any lending that happens. And of course, a lot of these programs involve forgiveness for businesses. There's also likely to be a lot of fraud. And finally, the nature of the political process makes it so that bigger businesses are able to lobby for more funds. And so even with the Small Business Administration, which was meant to um, help inject $350 billion worth of loans into the small business sector, a lot of that money has gone to the some of the largest business applicants, and some of them are related to big franchise brands that weren't the primarily intended beneficiaries of this. So all of those things complicate the the effectiveness of this and also don't necessarily follow the spirit of, of the program. I'm generally partial to um, support, direct support to individuals because it tends to facilitate the adaptation and, and the reallocation of resources over the medium term that um, we like to see. But also you could have grants to businesses in the same way, assuming that these are all uh, viable uh, and, and let them spend it as they see fit rather than have these intricate loan programs, some of which, uh, some of which are forgivable and others are not, uh, and so on. Yeah, I'm actually more sympathetic to the idea of the support for businesses, but I think Aaron set out the alternatives well. Um, what you know, There is a big near-term economic cost to letting good businesses go to the wall, and although Diego is right in that direct support to individuals would facilitate 
the most rapid adjustment to the to the new economy there wouldn't be that trade off in terms of relief of keeping newly unviable businesses alive uh, that would come with a big uh, near term cost that i think could have risked severe economic contagion and potentially financial contagion as well but what you can't really do and which congress tried to do was to do both so they tried to get as much money out of the door they introduced this uh, paycheck protection program which is loans that are then forgiven if firms keep uh, people on their payroll uh, and at the same time, they introduced much more a generous unemployment insurance, adding on a $600 per week um, addition to, to ordinary state level unemployment benefits for people laid off as a result of, of COVID-19. And the problem there is that these two programs, to a certain extent, are now working against each other. Um, firms that are in difficulty naturally, because the business people want to keep their business alive, are, are seeking to all the problems that Diego mentioned notwithstanding apply to the SBA for um, loans from this Paycheck Protection Program. And they know that if they keep their workers on, uh, most of that loan will, will be forgiven. Now, at the same time, the unemployment insurance for many workers uh, means that being unemployed and claiming unemployment insurance uh, is financially preferable in the near term to being kept on by your employer. Um, to be, from being kept on to payroll. So what we're starting to see in the media is stories develop where um, an employer discusses with its employees, particularly small businesses that it's applying for the loans through this Paycheck Protection Program, and the employees are getting angry at their employer because they know that if they were able to obtain unemployment insurance instead, they'd be financially better off. So as a result of, of trying to do both, of walking and, and chewing gum at the same time, uh, to a certain extent, the federal government is making the recovery more difficult because more individuals are choosing or, or prefer to be on unemployment insurance. Um, and that means that even if lockdowns are lifted in the near term, uh, the supply of available uh, employees for many businesses that have been struggling won't be there. And in the nearer term, uh, of course, the more um, employees badger their employers to lay them off, the less of those paycheck protection program loans that will be forgiven. So employers are being put in a, an incredibly difficult situation where uh, for the viability of their own business, they want to keep as many people on as possible if they're able to obtain one of these loans. But the employees of the business quite often have a financial incentive to be laid off. Now, we're seeing governments around the, the world, and, uh, I think maybe America takes the cake in this as usual with uh, unprecedented levels of spending. Um, I think I've seen some estimates that show we might have a $6 trillion deficit this year. Uh, how does that compare to, say, wartime deficits as a percentage? And is it, does this concern you in the long run, having essentially tripling what would usually be our deficit in a year? Well, you're essentially then talking about, if I'm doing the mental arithmetic quickly in my head, uh, budget deficit over 20% of GDP. In wartime, sometimes they, they go up much higher than that. Um, so it would be significant. You know, it would be the most significant budget deficit outside of wartime. And as a consequence of that, of course, you build up the accumulated debt. Uh, and I believe I'm right in saying that most people estimate that as a result of this, uh, the, the debt to GDP ratio will exceed 100% of, of annual GDP, such that uh, this will be the highest debt level that has been accumulated, certainly since the uh, the Second World War. So that kind of puts it into context. Of course, the broader context here is that over the next few decades, as a result of um, aging and, and the acceleration of um, demographic related spending on Social Security, uh, and Medicare as a result of those two programs. Um, the federal government has these huge contingent liabilities that it's on the hook for. Um, and so when previously we've had debts of this level, particularly after World War II, many countries uh, tolerated much higher inflation in the subsequent decades to try to inflate away some of that debt. That becomes much more difficult when you're sailing into um, commitments that are either inflation proof or real demands on government activity. So it's much, much more difficult to inflate away 
the debt that is being accumulated today, given what we're going to see in the next few decades. And I think it's very highly likely that as soon as this is over, uh, after a couple of years, we will see a big discussion about um, emergency tax rises um, and quite significant tax rises for a, for a short time. I share Ryan's concern, and the only silver lining that I can see is that hopefully this experience teaches us that there are unforeseen circumstances in which levels of expenditure that no one had expected may be needed in the short term, and that therefore running permanent structural deficits in the way that most Western countries have done uh, for the last 20 years or so, particularly to sustain the big healthcare and, and, and social welfare programs that they run, that they're unsustainable because you cannot, like Italy, find yourself hit by a national emergency of this kind, which is basically unavoidable and where an increase in spending will happen and a decline in GDP will happen with coming in with public debt 130% of GDP and unemployment at 8, 9, 10, 11% of GDP. And, oh, sorry, at 10, 10, 10, 11%. And, um, and then expect to come out in a position to deal with that. So, you know, hopefully that will prompt a rethinking. We've also seen a lot of development in the banking sector. Uh, in the CARES Act, we've seen some alteration to mortgages. Uh, and we've also seen a lot of activity from the Fed. Now, most of that I don't actually understand. Uh, but, uh, I, Diego, you, you, that's more your area. Is that that kind of quantitative easing and whatever else they're calling these kind of activity and within the banks, is that something that, that is a good idea in the way it's been done? It's, it's enormous and so difficult to assess in aggregate uh, at this stage. Part of it may be justified to the extent that changes in expectations and fears of the disease cause financial markets to seize up. And so you ended up with a classic liquidity crisis, which is what central banks have in the past often been called upon to address by injecting liquidity into the system. They purchase assets and therefore enable transactions to happen, and they prevent um, big declines in prices and you know fire sales and, and, and a full-fledged panic in that way. But the Fed has involved itself not only in financial markets in the way that it does, buying and selling treasury bonds, buying and selling some of the highest quality corporate debt and so on, but by lending to essentially every business of every size uh, in America, either directly or through the bond markets, because the Fed is providing liquidity to all the facilities that the Treasury Department has set up to help small businesses through the SBA program, through what is called a Main Street lending facility, which is meant to lend to larger businesses directly, and, and then to buy bonds that are corporate, commercial real estate bonds, which are certainly not without risk, and various other instruments. So this intervention is historically unprecedented at least as far as I'm aware, some of the programs were active during the Great Recession, but there have been a raft of additional programs added since. And the big question is whether the separation between fiscal policy and monetary policy can be maintained in that context. Because with the Fed getting involved in so many debt markets, yes, the Treasury can put up some share of the capital, and that share of the capital can take taxpayer losses, in which case you would preserve the distinction. But ultimately, if that buffer isn't big enough, you find yourself in a situation where the Fed is doing fiscal policy. And obviously, there have been, in addition, proposals in Congress, um, particularly by Democratic members, to have the Fed engage in monetary financing of the debt to try and deal with some of the uh, indebtedness that will result out of this. So. I think on the whole, it's a very concerning set of events. And of course, having happened in an emergency, it's bound to, it's bound to lead to an overreaction and, and setting a precedent that we may regret. You know, you said, it, you asked Diego, is this a good idea? Ordinarily, economists would judge macroeconomic policy on the degree to which they um, smooth over the business cycle, um, prevent sharp uh, volatility in, in output and GDP. And also whether they then in the longer term have a, a deleterious effect on the sustainable growth rate of the economy. Uh, we're in a very different situation today. The aim of both ma uh, the policies that Diego's outlined there from a monetary perspective, but also fiscal policy, 
isn't really to stimulate the economy. The aim is not to drive up GDP, because, of course, in order to deal with the public health consequences of the pandemic, we're deliberately closing down much of the economy. It's much more to avert this public health crisis becoming um, a broader financial crisis, whereby um, if people are unable to pay their bills, they default on their bills, things pass up a chain, and then it puts uh, banks and other financial institutions in trouble. So it's much better to think of these extraordinary measures that are being taken as trying to prevent the the floor falling away from the economy rather than trying to stimulate it now the real question is as we as we rebound into what i suspect will be a robust recovery because i expect you know we're a dynamic economy relatively flexible labor market i think when things do open in earnest um and i'm talking about after the end of the pandemic here not necessarily after the end of the lockdown uh, there will still be a discussion about the, de the degree to which the federal government should stimulate the economy and the Fed should stimulate the economy in various ways. I think that's um, an interesting conversation and potentially a very dangerous one um, because we're not really going to understand until we're out of this crisis what the supply capacity of the economy looks like. And if you're really trying to ramp up demand in a world where there are still severe supply constraints, we could see quite um, wild price changes in certain markets uh, and a lot of uh, resources being allocated very inefficiently as a result. So uh, that debate will come. But for now, it's important to realize that the aim isn't to stimulate the economy as much as prevent this turning into a longer term, you know, a, a deep depression with bigger scarring consequences. Given how grim a lot of what you're describing sounds and how many worries both of you have expressed about not just the short term, but the long term state of the U.S. and the global economy, what's going on with the stock market right now? We saw, you know, when, when the lockdowns began and it was clear the pandemic was here, the stock market plunged, but it's now regained a significant portion of those. And we're recording this on April 23rd, and it'll go out in a week. So I, there's a worry that this question will sound terribly dated by that time, but it continues to climb back up. And why is it doing that if the long-term economic output is as troubling as what you've articulated? Primarily because capital markets tend to operate on expectations. And so whatever you see in capital markets often tends to reflect what the view is of the future. And I think as we approached the global spread of the pandemic in mid to late February and early March, first of all, people were very uncertain about how big the spread would be, um, what the length of shutdown in economic activity would be, how quickly China could recover. And that was probably priced in, and it was probably priced in with a premium of security. People were leaving risky asset markets and going into government bonds, going into cash in a bit to avoid future fluctuations. And so when we hit bottom, we, by the way, had the quickest bear market in American history uh, during this period. Um, once, that, once those events have transpired, then expectations are readjusted. And I think some of the correction upwards is a reflection of that. doesn't mean that it's correct, by the way, and it doesn't mean that the market couldn't go down again. But I think it reflects... Um, the greater availability of information and the sense that countries are past the peak, that some countries perhaps haven't had the health crises that they expected, and also the fact that economic activity in China seems to be picking up, even if not as much as official Chinese uh, statistics are telling us. Yes, I agree with that. Um, if you, uh, it just made me laugh, actually, when Aaron asked the question, because a few weeks ago, I remember seeing on television there was like a ticker tape at the, at the top of the screen saying uh, one of the best weeks for the Dow Jones in goodness knows how many years. And then at the bottom of the screen, it said uh, unemployment in the US, un initial unemployment claims up to uh, 16 million. And, and those, you know, somebody watching that who wasn't attuned to economics might think there's a huge discrepancy there. I think it's worth emphasizing a point that Diego made that we're operating here in a world of radical uncertainty, both about the um, the virus itself, the effective the effectiveness of measures to contain it, how many people have actually had it, 
um, whether there are policies, alternatives to lockdowns that could see many businesses resume activity safely. So any new information that gets fed into that in a world of quite strong uncertainty tends to lead to big shifts in, in uh, people's investment activity. Um, but one point I would make, as large as all the effects sound, it's just worth re-emphasizing the point I made in my first answer, is that most economists would expect once the pandemic is over, that there would be quite a rapid rebound. In economic terms, we, you know, we are talking about dis disruption, I think, for one to three years. Uh, that may sound an awfully long time, but in the you know, the grand sweep of history, it's quite a, a short time to be dealing with a uh, an episode like this. And, you know, workers still have their skills right now. Um, the factories and offices still exist. They're not being destroyed as a result of this. It's true. A lot of economic relationships will be torn to shreds as a result of um, sustained lockdowns and depressions of activity. Uh, as liquidity crises quickly become solvency crises, businesses fail, and it will take some time for resources to reallocate. But there's no reason not to expect when this passes that the American economy won't rebound strongly. My contention, though, is that it won't rebound to where it would have been had the pandemic uh, never existed. So I don't think we'll, we'll be looking at a back to the future recovery um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't think we should overdo the longer term doom and gloom um, because this is still an incredibly vibrant and dynamic economy. And of course, an economy is made up of people and ideas and they will still be there after this crisis passes. I agree. And I think that's a very important point and one that we should keep in mind because it has policy implications. Every industry during a moment of crisis will bring itself up as key and fundamentally viable and just affected by short-term problems, uh, but not every industry like that is solvent. And there's a danger that we assume that a business going into bankruptcy means destruction in the way that Ryan described, destruction of assets as would happen in a war. The fact is, as Ryan described, that the factories will remain, the employees will keep most of their skills and be able to use them, and the business will simply go into some sort of, uh, some of them, of course, sadly will go into liquidation, but most of the larger business will probably be repossessed by the creditors and they would restructure them in a way that makes them viable again. That's a fundamental part of a, of a thriving market economy. And one dangerous outcome out of this might be that we think that the best is to just freeze things every time we have a major crisis happen. That's not the lesson. It's an interesting uh analogy, I was going to, I was going to bring that up myself about destruction after a war, say in post-war Germany or post-war Japan had absolutely devastating with the destruction of office buildings and capital. And those recovered pretty quickly. But it seems to me that the question now, which is we've come up a little bit here, is how much have, will things change in terms of people's behavior, even if these rules change? So let's talk a little bit about getting out of the lockdown. Um, I mean, I know Ryan, you've written a little bit about this. What's the best way of like kind of doing the cost benefit analysis when we're thinking about how to ease some of these restrictions and comparing it to the economic costs to the costs uh, borne by the disease? Well, let me talk about how most economists have done it and then outline where I think there's some problems. So what most economists do is they take a epidemiological model of how many people are expected to die if we do nothing in this in this um uh, facing this virus, um, and then look at the epidemiological models for how many people um, could be saved with quite suppressive measures. And that comes to a large number, usually over a million Americans saved if you have uh, a lockdown compared to doing nothing. Then what they do is they take a, an economic concept called the value of a statistical life, which um, tends to be obtained by looking at how people make decisions in labor markets about the amount of risk that they're willing to bear and how much they have to be compensated to deal with that risk to then work out how much implicitly people value their lives. And when you do that, you come to a very, very big number. Uh, I think the federal government uses 9.3 uh, million per life. So what it's quite common for uh, people to do is take that number, multiply it by the uh, number of lives saved, and then say, um, and that usually comes to a huge number, by the way, some studies have, uh, depending on how many lives saved, come to, to say 8 million, 8, 8 trillion, sorry, 
um, uh, benefit to lockdowns. And then what people, a lot of people conclude from that is, okay, given that huge benefit from the lockdown, we should be willing to tolerate eight trillion worth of one-time output losses um, in order to deal with this virus. And that's over a third of GDP. So that's what many economists do, and they stop there. I think there are big problems with that approach, and I'll just quickly go through four of them. The first is that there's a huge contention about how we should value life um, for people of different ages. Um, you know, one might say that uh, an 80 year old, and obviously that's the biggest risk group is the over 80s from this virus. Um, uh, even, you, you know, you can work out life expectancy, but one might imagine that you, because you're less able to do particular things after a given age, that the, the value of life in a kind of economic term uh, is, is lower than perhaps um, for the for the general population. So some people would adjust by that and and use the value of a statistical life year and look at life expectancy at eighty rather than um, rather than a full life value of a statistical life. The second thing is obviously there's huge uncertainty over the number of lives saved by lockdowns, particularly in comparison to a world of social distancing. I don't think it's appropriate to model this the value of a lockdown or the benefits against doing nothing. The alternative seems to me a huge degree of voluntary social distancing, which we were seeing even prior to um, the lockdown. Um, the third problem is that GDP losses saying, oh, because there's 8 trillion of, of benefits from this, um, we should be willing to tolerate uh, Eight trillion in in GDP losses doesn't account for the fact that when we're locked down at home, uh, we're losing a lot of non market liberties too. The ability to see family and friends, the ability to take part in particular sports, and they have value. Very difficult to value effectively, but they have value too, which would lower the GDP losses we should be willing to tolerate. And just finally, because I know I'm droning on, of course, this whole debate quite often frames implicitly the discussion as lockdown against no lockdown or doing nothing when in reality there are a huge range of things that we might think about doing in terms of safety protocols in industries in terms of um, isolating just vulnerable individuals in terms of allowing people of certain ages to go out a whole range of things that we could model um, and just because lockdowns might be preferable to doing nothing doesn't mean it's optimal. What the government should be looking to do if they're going to use this cost benefit framework is try and find the policy set that minimizes the total economic cost of this virus. So that's the health costs and the economic cost too. So they were, they're the changes that I would make to reviewing this. And when you do that, um, it's a much finer balanced discussion. Um, I accept there's a huge degree of uncertainty that was faced. So I understand why people decided to adopt the lockdowns. But from here, we should be really looking at, you know, on what margins can we maintain low risk, but at much lower economic cost? Well, that seems not different. It's something that's been bothering me a bit because it doesn't seem different. I mean, it's extraordinary times where the cost benefit analysis is still pretty much the same, where there seems to be some group of people who believe like public health experts will be the ones who tell us that it is quote unquote safe. And then we like flip the switch and turn the economy on again. But public health experts don't actually know what level of risk is acceptable to people because that's a personal economic choice. So we need to change our paradigm and we won't just reopen the economy. It'll be some people who have, who feel like they have less risk to themselves, who need, who need, can't work from home, will be more willing to take a risk to get the virus. Uh, than other people. And that's the conversation we should be having. And in the face of these lockdown protests with people criticizing them, just let the scientists tell us what to do. That seems like the wrong approach. One thing that's, um, what, sorry, I, I was just going to say that one thing that has really impressed me from the outset of this pandemic is the way in which private institutions and companies and just the private side of the economy has been able to come to arrangements that try to mitigate the worst effects and the biggest dangers of this, while at the same time reducing the economic damage caused. So a lot of people will say that it was, of course, it was the Congress acting and passing the CARES Act that really changed things. But in fact, a lot of banks were already providing 
for forgiveness and forbearance and you know dealing with their customers in special ways to try and smooth the impact of this before you had any legislation. Similarly, around the world, you're seeing employers try and find ways to provide masks and tests and other um, medical supplies that are needed to work safely, while at the same time ensuring they can go back into business as quickly as possible. So having a situation in which the people who bear the cost are also the ones making the decisions and that they have an incentive to help the people around them, understanding that that is the case, I think will be very important as we come out of the lockdown. Yeah, I agree with Diego on that. Um, obviously, from an economic perspective, thinking of this, this is a big externality problem. Um, and what I mean by that is ordinarily economists think about people optimizing their behavior, uh, but you know, may not on paper take into consideration the impact of their behavior on others when making decisions. So the usual kind of uh, market failure framework would then have somebody come in and say, um, well, the government needs to act because rational individuals wouldn't be acting to try and prevent this, this spread of this disease to the extent that they should, except for trying to avoid contracting the virus themselves. Um, so therefore, we need uh, you know, government intervention. And perhaps because of the uh, how difficult it would be to impose some some type of tax on people interacting, some regulatory suppressive measures are necessary. What I think uh, Diego showed there is that as a result of those economic interactions that we make every day, uh, what that framework forgets is that there are very, very strong incentives for people who are meeting regularly, uh, people who are employing people to provide safety protocols that internalize some of that externality. So they account for some of that externality, uh, meaning that the degree to which you need suppressive regulatory interventions is diminished. And I think that's really important. We saw it not just, um, we saw it not just in terms of changes in, uh, behavior in, you know, with people, fewer people going on flights and to restaurants, even prior to the lockdowns being, uh, implemented, but also we've seen it in countries with the lockdowns to a certain extent too. Um, I was reading today, for example, that in the UK, the uh, the government there had assumed a whole bunch of uh, proportions of the populations that wouldn't comply with the lockdown. And what they found is that uh, people have followed the rules much more uh, strictly than they assumed, which suggests that their models of what people do do rationally uh, insufficiently account for that altruistic uh, behavior and that internalization of the externalities that Diego highlighted there. One of the things people seem particularly bad at, and we can see this in a very vivid example in our response to September 11th and terrorism in general, is thinking through the likelihood of or the risks from exceedingly rare events with high costs. And, and that we have a tendency, not just governments, but individuals to overestimate how likely these risks are. And so we've been talking about people adjusting to the risk of this pandemic. Like you, you go back out and there's a risk that you get infected by COVID-19 and how do we weigh those risks? But what potentially worries me in our ongoing response to this is how people respond to the potential risk of another pandemic. Like so it's been it's been a hundred years since we've had something on, you know, arguably on this scale. These don't appear to happen all that often. But is there a worry that we permanently make changes in the long term, whether that's like reducing global supply chains because we don't, you know, we're we're worried about international travel or cutting immigration or just engaging in like deep cultural change that's based on everyone now thinking that the next pandemic is right around the corner? Well, I think there's two different, um, I think there's almost two different issues there. The history of pandemics appears to suggest that what they do is accelerate uh, political and social trends that were occurring beforehand. Um, and of course, some of that um, was a re-rise of protectionism and these very mercantilistic arguments about trade. And so I suspect that this um, sorry episode will be used as a precursor to trying to 
explicitly repatriate a whole range of supply chains, particularly in in medical goods. So I do worry about that. Um, And one reason that I worry about that, of course, is that no two pandemics are ever alike. And um, a tendency through history is to try and uh, fight the last war almost. Um, Lots of people had thought that there was a risk of a global pandemic for a long time, uh, but they expected that pandemic to be a flu-like pandemic. Now, um, you could do some planning for that and you could build a stockpile of things like ventilators and masks and by all accounts, they've come in useful. But some of the um, some of the medical reading from the, f- the past couple of days appears to suggest that maybe this virus operates in a way differently to just a respiratory disease. So, uh, you know, we could have uh, prepared for a flu-like pandemic, but if then a future virus has very, very different characteristics, then the preparation that we've done may not be uh, applicable to that scenario. The second point I just make, though, is that I don't think it's very easy when it comes to issues like this to write down in the same way as you can with terror attacks. And, you know, you can vary the assumptions based on where you live and what the demographics of the population are like. And you can come to some sort of uh, number of the risk that you might die in a terror attack. And I know that, that people do lots of that analysis. Here we're talking about quite radical uncertainty. Uh, we're still very, very unclear as to how much of this virus is actually in the population, still unclear about the degree to which it leaves permanent uh, lung damage or other damage to people who've had even uh, episodes with mild symptoms. Um, And there's a huge range of uncertainties about what pre-existing conditions actually uh, worsen your prospects. And of course, not everybody knows whether they have pre-existing conditions. So whilst I think that type of risk analysis is something that we have to infuse in the public debate, particularly around how people interact and which activities reduce risk best, given what we know, uh, it's worth having a bit of humility and recognizing there's a huge degree of uncertainty here. Uh, so one can understand why people in this case might be more precautionary than than would uh and you know a full and proper examination of risks in the in a situation where we had perfect knowledge uh, how much risk people should be willing to take on one notable thing to me about this pandemic is that it's happened at a moment when we have affluence that in the west we've had for a while but around the world has only begun to come in in the last two or three decades. And my own perception of the response is that it reflects the ability to, um, you know, the fact that we have the resources to deal with a lockdown and keep people home and we have the information to react relatively rapidly to these events in a way that we didn't in the past. But I think one potential downside or risk from this is that we become excessively risk averse. This is a trend that scholars had noted um, for some time in the last couple of decades, Tyler Cowan in the complacent class. We also saw it in regulatory policy where there's a lot of focus on minimizing the adverse side effects and aversion to building and changing environments in a way that might be risky and so on. And I do worry that culturally, this will reinforce that trend, where this will become precisely, Aaron, as you were pointing out, because of the immediate availability bias that we have, that and this is such a striking event that is being broadcast and, you know, tweeted constantly at us, that that will reinforce trends that make us precautionary, but in a way that is in the long term damaging to our own progress and and, and the development of future healthcare, as well as other uh, kinds of um, well-being enhancing activities i think there might be two potential different schools of thought as we come out of this one of them was actually um i saw in an essay by uh, mark andreessen a few days ago and i think what some people would take away from this is my god we have been complacent on a whole range of issues and actually lots of our institutions and the regulations that they've put out have gummed up much economic activity such that it's much more difficult to uh, flexibly prepare for these crises, but also react to them when they're hit. So I think, you know, one potential political movement that you might see as a result of this is actually the the opposite of what Diego just said, in that you might get a pushback for quite extensive uh, 
reinvigoration of uh, American frontier capitalism, um, and uh, uh, and that might come in regard actual government activity, true, but it also might mean uh, quite radical deregulation as well. Now, I don't think that's likely, but I think you know that could be a political movement you see. The other flip side, though, is that we might see something uh, like Diego has alluded to, where we do become risk averse, where people say in particular that this episode shows that we should act uh, hugely and, and destructively now uh, to deal with the climate change issue with quite suppressive measures to suppress economic activity. And I think that's a tension that we're going to see as we come out of this, those two different uh, conclusions about what this means for how we operate as a society and the implications for policy, I think is going to be quite fraught. And people are already trying to write that history already whilst we're in the middle of the pandemic. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.